Perhaps this may explain to some extent why the subject of slavery through debt was so extensively emphasized in Lesson 4 on the habit of saving. We want that lesson to sink in. Edwin Barnes not only believed in the soundness of the law of success philosophy, but his own financial success had demonstrated, as had also his close business relationship with the greatest inventor on earth, that he had the right to speak with authority on the subject of the laws through which success may be achieved. I began my work of research with the belief that success could be attained by anyone with reasonable intelligence and a real desire to succeed, by following certain, then by me unknown, rules of procedure. I wanted to know what these rules were and how they could be applied. Mr. Barnes believed as I did. Moreover, he was in a position to know that the astounding achievements of his business associate, Mr. Edison, came about entirely through the application of some of the principles which later were tested and included as a part of this philosophy. From his way of thinking, it seemed that the accumulation of money, enjoying peace of mind and finding happiness, could be brought about by the application of never-varying laws which anyone might master and apply. That was my belief also. That belief has now been transformed into not merely a provable but a proved reality as I hope every student of this course will have reason to understand when the course shall have been mastered. Please keep in mind that during all these years of research, I was not only applying the law covered by this lesson by doing more than paid for, but I was going much further than this by doing work for which I did not, at the time I was doing it, hope ever to receive pay. Thus, out of years of chaos, adversity, and opposition, this philosophy was finally completed and reduced to manuscripts, ready for publication. For a time, nothing happened. I was resting on my oars, so to speak, before taking the next step toward placing the philosophy in the hands of people who I had reason to believe would welcome it. God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. During the earlier years of my experience, I thought these words to be empty and meaningless, but I have since modified my belief considerably. I was invited to deliver an address in Canton, Ohio. My coming had been well advertised, and there was reason to expect that I would have a large audience. To the contrary, conflicting meetings being held by two large groups of businessmen reduced my audience to the lucky number of thirteen. It has always been my belief that a man should do his best, regardless of how much he receives for his services, or the number of people he may be serving, or the class of people served. I went at my subject as though the hall were filled. Somehow there arose in me a sort of feeling of resentment on account of the way the wheel of fate had turned against me, and if I ever made a convincing speech, I made it that night. Down deep in my heart, however, I thought I had failed. I did not know until the next day that I was making history the night before that was destined to give the law of success philosophy its first real impetus. One of the men who sat in my audience as one of the thirteen was the late Don R. Mellet, who was then the publisher of the Canton Daily News, brief reference to whom I made in the introductory lesson of this course. After I had finished speaking, I slipped out at the back door and returned to my hotel, not wanting to face any of my thirteen victims on the way out. The next day I was invited to Mr. Mellet's office. Inasmuch as it was he who had taken the initiative by inviting me in to see him, I left it to him to do most of the talking. He began in something like this fashion. Would you mind telling me your entire life story from the days of your early childhood up to the present? I told him I would do so if he could stand the burden of listening to so long a narrative. He said he could, but before I began, he cautioned me not to omit the unfavorable side. What I wish you to do, said he, is to mix the fat with the lean and let me take a look at your very soul, not from its most favorable side, but from all sides. For three hours I talked while Mellet listened. I omitted nothing. I told him of my struggles, of my mistakes of my impulses to be dishonest when the tides of fortune swept against me too swiftly, and of my better judgment which prevailed in the end, but only after my conscience and I had engaged in prolonged combat. I told him how I conceived the idea of organizing the law of success philosophy, how I had gone about gathering the data that had gone into the philosophy, of the tests I had made which resulted in the elimination of some of the data and the retention of other parts of it. After I had finished, Mellet said, 
I wish to ask you a very personal question, and I hope you will answer it as frankly as you have told the remainder of your story. Have you accumulated any money from your efforts? And if not, do you know why you have not? No, I replied. I have accumulated nothing but experience and knowledge and a few debts, and the reason, while it may not be sound, is easily explained. The truth is that I have been so busy all these years in trying to eliminate some of my own ignorance, so I could intelligently gather and organize the data that have gone into the law of success philosophy, that I have had neither the opportunity nor the inclination to turn my efforts to making money. The serious look on Don Mellet's face, much to my surprise, softened into a smile as he laid his hand on my shoulder and said, I knew the answer before you stated it, but I wondered if you knew it. You probably know that you are not the only man who has had to sacrifice immediate monetary remuneration for the sake of gathering knowledge. For in truth, your experience has been that of every philosopher from the time of Socrates down to the present. These words fell as the sound of music upon my ears. I had made one of the most embarrassing admissions of my life. I had laid my soul bare, admitting temporary defeat at almost every crossroad which I had passed in my struggles and I had capped all this off by admitting that an exponent of the law of success was himself a temporary failure. How incongruous it seemed! I felt stupid, humiliated, and embarrassed as I sat in front of the most searching pair of eyes and the most inquisitive man I had ever met. The absurdity of it all came over me like a flash. The philosophy of success, created and broadcasted by a man who was obviously a failure. This thought struck me so forcibly that I expressed it in words. What? Mellet exclaimed. A failure? Surely you know the difference between failure and temporary defeat, he continued. No man is a failure who creates a single idea, much less an entire philosophy, that serves to soften the disappointments and minimize the hardships of generations yet unborn. I wondered what was the object of this interview. My first conjecture was that Mellet wanted some facts on which to base an attack in his newspaper on the law of success philosophy. Perhaps this thought grew out of some of my previous experiences with newspaper men, a few of whom had been antagonistic toward me. At any rate, I decided at the outset of the interview to give him the facts, without embellishment, come from it what would. Before I left Mellet's office, we had become business partners, with the understanding that he would resign as publisher of the Canton Daily News and take over the management of all my affairs as soon as this could be arranged. 